other buildings. So. Um, hi. Hi. I'm Casey. Um, this is Nathan. Howdy. I was just told that he's um, Ernie to my bird. Which <laughs> sucks for you guys because I'll be doing most of the talking. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so I brought up the idea on the mailing list of doing kind of a comparison of Ruby and Elixir. I'm going to make the assumption that uh, we all love Ruby here. <laughs> And I'm also going to make the assumption that none of us were born loving Ruby. So there was something about it, uh, probably either the productivity that it gave you or the community that it drew you into to Ruby uh, as a language. Uh, and uh, basically what I'm hoping to leave you with is an idea of where Elixir is in its growth as a language and whether or not it's something that you would also want to learn to love. Um, cool. uh, okay, so how many people have heard of Elixir, the programming language? Yeah, that is a lot. It's more than I expected. So Elixir is a programming language uh, that's roughly based on another programming language called Erlang, and uh, the primary canonical complaint about Erlang as a language is that the syntax is ugly. Um, I'm not particularly in that camp, but whatever, that's what most people think. So some people uh, who have a better programming aesthetic than I have uh, decided that they would make the syntax look very much like Ruby syntax. And they did, and they call that uh, Elixir. Oh, by the way, so I'll be doing most of the talking. Nathan is correct, uh, the many technical Misassertions that I'm going to make. The sideline bike shedder, I guess. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's actually my excuse. So he'll, he'll be pedantic about some technical things so that I don't have to be uh, pedantic about 100% of this presentation. Right. Because, um, yeah, ideology and programming languages, that never devolves into that. <laughs> So Elixir, the syntax looks kind of similar to Ruby, and I won't show you a lot of code, but enough that you'll kind of go, oh yeah, that looks like Ruby. Uh, but it compiles to bytecode for Erlang. So under the hood, it uses Erlang's VM, uh, which is called the Beam. If I, if I slip, I'll call it Beam. I'll try to call it Erlang's VM. Uh, and it, it, the code actually runs on that. Um, so I'll lay out a... Uh, methodology for comparing the two programming languages, and then I'll focus on uh, a couple um, of those uh, methods, and then kind of uh, sum up with, with a conclusion about where Elixir is. Uh, Joey, I'm also going to make this difficult for you because I tend to pace. So. Okay. Uh, so some different ways we can compare uh, languages. One is bias. Um, I'll explain to you what my bias is so that you can take that into account uh, when, you, when you're listening to what I say so that I'm, I'm pretty sure you can then subtract it and everything that I say is objectively true. <laughs> so we can look at uh, bias coming to programming languages, uh, technical virtue, um, some languages perform well and some don't. Uh, learning curve, how long it takes to learn in programming language, uh, the community around it, uh, the productivity that it gives you as a software engineer, um, probably more important for contractors than people who are FTEs. I'm going to let that one go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, applicative <laughs> domain. So when you, the areas that it's useful to use that programming language. Um, these three are less important to me, so I'll talk about them quickly. Uh, bias, my bias, our bias, is uh, coming from uh, distributed systems that are highly available, so they always have to give a response. And, uh, you know, things that, like, lives depend on, or uh, uh, server monitoring depends on, stuff like that. Or uh, fault-tolerant systems, systems that are large enough that you optimistically expect that stuff will break. So like if, you have, if you're running a lot of servers, you know servers are going to go down. 
and you need a system that can anticipate stuff's going to break and just work around it. So that's where we're coming from. I've been programming Ruby, oh God, almost 10 years now, and uh, Erlang uh, off and on for about three. Uh, learning curve, the learning curve, uh, Elixir as a language has a really small uh, footprint. Uh, I didn't count, but I think it's safe to say that the standard lib is much smaller than Ruby's standard lib. And I think Ruby's is pretty small compared to other, program, other, other mature programming languages. Uh, and so the learning curve uh, isn't for Elixir is, it isn't hard. It's pretty low for a programming language um, coming from somebody who can program in it. <laughs> so that's worth it. And the community is really small because it's still a small uh, programming language. Well, it's, it's still a very young programming language. So it was originally, uh, the first release was about three and a half years ago, something like that. Uh, this past year, they had the first Elixir Conf in Austin, uh, and um, it's still small. It's very, very pleasant. The people uh, in the community currently are very nice. There might be a Zed Shaw in there hiding, but uh, right now, I'm sorry, Zed, just kidding. Um, but it's, right now, it's a really fun community. So we'll just ignore those and focus on the other three. The technical virtue of the language, the productivity, and the applicative domain. So the technical virtue. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how airline, air, uh, how Elixir works based on it compiling in, into uh, airline. By comparison to um, conventions in Ruby, Rails in particular, that I, I hope are familiar. So this is heresy. <laughs> But I'll say it. So modules in, in Elixir are roughly, you can at least think of them as being somewhat analogous to classes, and processes in Elixir as being roughly analogous to objects. So um, I'm, I'm just going to pick on people whose names I can see. So um, Daniel, I think it's here. Um, Daniel's a classy guy, so we'll assume he is. The, uh, the epitome of the Daniel class, right? So if we're making uh, some sort of web uh, application framework, we want to say, uh, give us a new instance of Daniel and whole process something and return some HTML, right? Easy enough. And Julio will say is uh, a module and Elixir. Very similar thing. Uh, when we want to process some HTML in this app, we'll uh, create an instantiation of Julio will create a process of Julio and he will compute some stuff and return HTML. Yeah. Does, does, are instances of Julio called Daniel? <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Ruby Elixir. Oh, okay. Sorry. Gotcha. <laughs> I have bike shed yet? Maybe. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Modules are only for co code organization. So when you're using classes to namespace stuff and then export that functionality to the outside world, that is the piece that is analogous between those two things. That was sufficiently pedantic. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so here's an interesting thing about you know, the technical virtue. People say, oh, Elixir is great because Erlang offers uh, concurrency out of the box. And here's roughly how, how it does that. Um, in, in the Ruby example, uh, more or less, if requests are coming in for this web page, we say, okay, we'll take Daniel, we'll make an instance of him, and you're now the Daniel object, right? Thank you. And you do something, Please and then you. you return. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and when you're done, then, sorry, you get destroyed. <laughs> now, life is short. Life is short. Uh, now, next request comes in, and it's a really it takes a lot of processing. But uh, same thing, uh, instance of Daniel uh, Ben. So you, you handle you have the the luck. The you're unlucky enough to handle this really long um, taking process. So it takes you a while, but finally you return it, and the HTML comes back, and then we go back to a quick one and a quick one. Okay. It was kind of unfair to the subsequent instances of Daniel that a very long processing one happened before that, right? Ruby blocks, in most cases it's blocking. So if you have a really long processing request for a single instance of a Rails app, it's, it's, it seems unfair to the request coming after it. 
Now in Elixir, what happens? Sure. <laughs> in Elixir, so if we take uh, the, the um, Julio uh, module and create a process from him, and that's a quick request. So I'm just going to go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So I'm not going to actually ask you to process this at all. Um, so some, some uh, parameters come in. It's just to render some, uh, some HTML and then return it. Um, but there are more requests. So what happens is we can go ahead and spawn up uh, many uh, processes on the airline VM. And we can give her the first request. And we cannot wait for her to finish processing it. We'll go ahead to the next one and so on. And then we'll come back and we'll say, OK, you have one Mississippi. Do you finish processing the request? Yes. OK, we're done. We return. You have one Mississippi. Do you finish returning the request? No, he's got the really long running one. OK, back of the line. Go to the next one. And they will finish. And he just goes through the line more times. He goes to the end of the queue more times. So it's like a more fair way to divvy up the tasks. Now, all else being equal, we didn't actually parallelize the code. We just made it concurrent. So all else being equal, over the course of an hour or so, the same amount of work got done. But because it was concurrent, the latency was a little bit more predictable. And from an end user experience, visiting web pages like this, most web users will feel like that's more fair. Did that make sense? <laughs> so in this case, uh, a process in the Elixir and Erlang world is uh, similar or a, an approximation of the actor model, uh, which is a concurrency model that is some people probably know about. Celluloid is a Ruby framework that provides a similar type of thing. Um, that part of it is more like an object. Um, in the way that the, because there's a state that gets tracked around and you can call, send messages to it and it will do things to, <clears throat> excuse me, to mutate that internal state. Uh, but as it's laid out here, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one So this is a gross misrepresentation, um, but it's great as a learning aid. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, so it's more or less the rub of, 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 of a concurrency story that you can make for why Elixir has good technical merit. Uh, so another one I want to touch on is security, um, and this is what security looks like in Elixir. There is nothing. So, uh, and this is hard to explain to people. So, I'm not talking about authentication in the application. I'm talking at the programming language level. So Erlang was developed for phone networks where they didn't want to send people out to the poll to fix things. They wanted to be able to log on locally and just send code down to the poll and have it run there. Or send code down to the poll and have it send code down to the next station and have it run. So what you end up with is if you can connect through an Erlang shell to any Erlang process, you can run any command uh, that has Erlang's permissions on that machine, or shut the program down, or do any other sort of malicious thing you would want to do. I don't assume anyone here would want to do malicious things. but uh, So it's the, the only way that I've seen to um, practically secure an Erlang application is to just put it behind a very strong firewall. So uh, security is, is kind of not in it, or it's a different uh, beast to consider. Yep. So it automatically opens up like network ports? Like, Question is, it, does it automatically open up network ports? Sort of. It's, it's always listening on certain ports for other airline virtual machines to connect to it, which is a plus when you want to run a distributed system and you just start airline up on all of these machines and then have one go reach out and they all can just start chatting to each other. Um, so what you have to firewall those. If, if those are open to the outside world, here are those. And another one is logging. This is not in Elixir's favor. This is, I just uh, grabbed this off of um, Stack Overflow a couple hours ago. 
This is some error message from an airline program. I have no idea what it says, and I would argue that nobody else does either. Ugh. Yeah, remember these? These are painful. So Elixir does not give out error messages in Elixir. It gives out stack traces from Airline. And they are notoriously difficult to understand. So logging, uh, understanding stack traces and logging is, is really difficult. Trust me, you do not know what this does. No, it sends in malformed JSON to the React Not Produce. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it does. It's web machine over it's, it's HTTP yeah, interface. It's not the JSON that was malformed. What was malformed? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, there was an undefined function that they tried to call. Oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, that, you wouldn't see that on this page. This goes on for a long time. <laughs> yeah, so error messages. That's, yeah, doesn't, it's, not, it's not great in Elixir. Uh, so, just to hop over to an example, um, I'm going to pick on uh, Chris McCord a little bit. So, I, I let him know, though, so I think that makes it okay. So, he put uh, this uh, blog post out. Yeah, I switched to it. Down there, the, this, that thing. And then up top. Okay, so he put up a blog post where he says, uh, Elixir versus Ruby Showdown, Phoenix versus Rails. So Phoenix is a content management uh, MVC style framework that he wrote in Elixir. And he says, um, isn't this apples to oranges? No. Well, I'm going to argue that it is. But uh, let's look at some code. Can I make this bigger? Yeah, plus. But just doing that. So at top is some Phoenix code, or Elixir code, and here's some the equivalent Rails code. So you can kind of look at it and go, I, I can make out vaguely what that means, and if I had to change a route from a get to a put, I, okay, I can figure that out. It's very, very similar. So there's the routing um, controllers. Again, same situation, we're looking at, you know, oh, th this is the Elixir code, and this is the Ruby code. It looks very similar. And I th it might even be exactly the same number of lines. Uh, views, this is the Elixir template, which looks very similar to ERB. So if you use Rails, the learning curve to using Phoenix um, is not going to be huge. And here are the results. So he ran uh, load testing, and uh, Rails had about uh, 1,000 requests per second, and Phoenix had about uh, 12,000 per second. So it's roughly uh, 10 times uh, faster, or was, on his local machine, which is not a great way to test it. He also tested it uh, on Heroku, and it was about eight times faster. Okay, so. So I think this is entirely an apples to oranges and a, a misleading comparison for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, Elixir gets compiled to bytecode. Uh, I don't think an 8 to 10 uh, times performance increase is actually very impressive for going from a scripted to a compiled language. That seems a little weak to me. Two, uh, he didn't test the full ORM stack. He didn't go through active record, he didn't hit a database. So I don't think that's really representative of uh, a content management system application. Uh, another point, Rails done well scales horizontally. If your Rails app is stateless, then you just bring up more stateless machines to handle more requests. And properly written, your application uh, from an architectural point of view should be bottlenecking at the state layer. Uh, so, I, you know, I, so I have a hard time uh, uh, seeing Phoenix's place because the Rails ecosystem already exists and you're trading uh, in um, all of those libraries that Rails offers for uh, a small performance increase. To me, that equation is never going to work out. You didn't find the latency the more interesting portion of that comparison? 
Uh, not really. Well, I already explained that. So uh, because Ruby blocks, the latency is going to be uh, a little bit higher. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, okay. um, so technical virtue. That's, that's kind of my really light touch overview of the technical virtue of Elixir as a language. So productivity. Uh, Erlang has this thing called OTP. Uh, you know what I forget what it stands for. Open Telecom Platform. There, that. Um, and which I am going to make another uh, uh, heinous uh, analogy to yep. active stuff. <laughs> uh, but for a reason, with, with productivity in mind. So OTP is a set of behaviors that you can uh, invoke, uh, that you can mix in into uh, your modules, uh, that handles a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of functionality for you, uh, so that you don't have to rewrite it, so that's better tested. Very similar to what the active frameworks do in Rails. Uh, so I'll give, give you a quick example. So here's an active record thing, right? You inherit from active record, and then you automatically get has many and all of the other basic uh, conventions for uh, SQL and validates name. Okay, so if you use Rails, this is very familiar. And if you use Rails, you know what has many does, you know that it's there, and you don't have to write joins based on the underlying data structure, right? So it saves you a lot of work. OTP does something similar, uh, except the, the OTP behaviors are much different than the active model behaviors. So here is a supervisor uh, behavior from OTP where you say um, this, this module, this bit of code, is going to have a, uh, a supervisor. Nathan will be our supervisor. And we're going to have these processes running, um, answering web, page, you know, web requests or, or whatever they're doing. Or fighting to the death. Or fighting, no, not, not fighting to the death. No, not doing that. Uh, making web pages. So we just define in his init, okay, he's, uh, he's got a children array, and the children array, ha array has some workers, and they're different modules, and they have different names. And then we call supervise these children with this strategy. And that strategy uh, tells the system, tells OTP, that if one of those children die, if something happens, they get malformed JSON, and they just stop working, then he, as the supervisor, will automatically be notified, and because it's a one-for-one -one strategy, he'll automatically restart that child. So there are patterns like that, which uh, are incredibly useful if you have to do stuff like that. Here are the five basic ones. Uh, a server, so you know there's a server and a client. Uh, one that handles events, a finance state machine, the supervisor, and an application, which is a way to package things together so that uh, these components interrupt pretty well. So it's similar to uh, the active uh, paradigm in that these conventions uh, handle a lot of work for you. So that's a big plus for productivity. And a applicative domain. When Ruby, when Rails came out, and when Rails really took off, there were thousands of content management, of MVC frameworks, we'll even say. A uh, couple, you know, a couple popular ones in Java, uh, just too many of them in PHP. And uh, Ruby wasn't particularly popular, so why did Rails win? Do have any theories? I'd actually like to hear a quick theory if anybody has one. I'm the only person who's thought about this. DHH is such a nice guy. DHH is such a nice guy. Have you met DHH? Uh, we'll leave that as a hypothesis. Um, so, okay, so I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and so my conclusion, um, for whatever that's worth, yeah? I, I think it's sort of like, WordPress was like too much on the CMS, it, it made too many decisions, but Rails made just enough decisions that like, you get to the point where you're like, okay, some of these decisions I don't agree with and I have to change them and fix them, but it was enough along that way, but not too far to be a full blown CMS. Okay, so the porridge was just right. It was like enough. Okay. Right layer of abstraction. Right layer of, of, of abstraction for the problems that we deal with as developers. Sure, that's plausible. I would say one of the reasons that it certainly gained a lot of attention is because there was a 15-minute demo. So DHH, nice guy, 
uh, posted on uh, an O'Reilly blog somewhere, this 15 minute demo to get Rails up and running. And most of the rest of us who are custom rolling our own uh, MVC frameworks and PHP, we couldn't write a new application uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, but there you had a full CRUD cycle on a resource running against the database, you know, in localhost on your web browser in 15 minutes. That seemed like an order of magnitude at least faster than how long it took to build applications previously. Uh, another reason is the conventions. Um, for me, one of the reasons conventions are so important is because most of my time programming is spent sitting back in my chair thinking of variable names. <laughs> and when you have conventions, you don't have to think of as many variable names. Right? What's the key for this table? Oh, somebody already thought of that for me. It's ID. Done. Uh, conventions also let you carry information from one project to the next. So, ID, that's a good variable. Uh, <laughs> so I can, I could, you know, any, any, any conventional uh, Rails application, I could start working on it today and be productive in, well, maybe tomorrow, and be productive in it that day because I know where all the files are, I know how it's going to use, uh, you know, active model. So that information carries over from project to project. That's really powerful. Um, and I will say this in quotes, you can quote me on this, Rails won despite poor performance, a poor deployment story, and poor paradigms. So I feel like we've all kind of just swallowed poor performance, like, ah, okay, performance is always going to suck. Who cares? It's fun language. Per perfectly reasonable. Poor de deployment story. Um, the horror stories from earlier on uh, in, in Rails history, I won't even go back that far. But uh, getting the, the right uh, uh, libraries bundled together in the proper order has been a problem for most of the history of, of Rails in terms of deployment. It's a lot better now than it's ever been. And poor paradigms, and I'll give you just one example of a poor paradigm in Rails. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? It's Snapple. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a terrible acronym. This is index show new edit create update delete. Yeah, those are the default methods for a controller. That's terrible. So Sinatra gets this right. There's no reason to have that layer of abstraction in there. It could simply just be get, put, post, then you know what it's doing, you know, when, why it's doing it. This paradigm is just weird, completely arbitrary. And so there's a couple other things like that um, that are unfavorable. So the convenience of having an application up and less, less and running in less than 15 minutes, and the conventions that go with it, and it being you know just the right temperature for porridge, uh, made Rails really successful. Um, does Elixir Phoenix have that? Well, it's borrowing the conventions, so it can kind of support that. But uh, you know it's much younger, so it doesn't have the other libraries that support those conventions. And it is certainly not an order of magnitude faster to build an application uh, in Phoenix uh, than in Rails. So I, I, I'm having a hard time uh, seeing, well, I could be really mean and put a strike through, through this, but uh, it's, it, it is a good project. Uh, Chris would say that the appeal to, for Phoenix isn't the, the content management system part. It's uh, something called channels, which is like a way to do soft real time for um, chat type applications. Um, I'm not convinced that that's production ready, but so applicative domain. I don't think this is it for for Elixir. Applicable applicative domain for uh, Elixir are these types of things. Basically, anything that Erlang is good at: network applications, <laughs> chat applications. If that's still a thing, I didn't think it was, but WhatsApp. Yeah, Snapchat recently. Yo. Oh God, yeah, Snapchat just raised a huge amount of money. Yo. Huh? Yo. Yeah. Yo. Yeah. Yo. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, Internet of Things stuff. That seems like a. Well, that's certainly a real thing. And fault tolerant systems where you 
expect things uh, to break, expect systems to go down. So in those types of applications, um, Elixir's a really good choice. Does anybody here write applications in these things? I'll even remove chat, just these three. Network applications, internet of things, fault tolerant systems. Okay, cool. So, like, the six of us could get yours. All right. Um, I will talk to other people that don't do those things. Oh, I was, yeah. <laughs> Do I have to? You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was uh, the methodology, and that's uh, an overview of the technical, the productivity, and the, the application for, uh, for Elixir. I think its biggest challenge is, one, it doesn't have a killer application. You can't look at the Elixir community and, and you know, the way you could at Ruby 10 years ago and say, Rails, that's the killer app for Ruby. Totally was the killer app for Ruby. Uh, Elixir doesn't have that. And it doesn't have a corporate sponsor. It doesn't have anybody yet, as far as I know, uh, who is making a uh, non-trivial production bet on the Elixir ecosystem where you know, the money is on the line. Um, who knows, maybe our sponsor will be that company for Elixir. Uh, so follow-up information, uh, Chris McCourt's presentation on Phoenix is online. You can Google him and find it online. I'm Casey, he's Nathan. Uh, and I just want to close with a poll. If there was an Elixir class at Airline Factory down in San Francisco in March, it's about $2,000 a person, refundable by your employer, uh, for three days of uh, training and two days of the conference, would anybody here be interested in going to that? If it was in Portland. Is it in Portland? It's. <laughs> <laughs> Have you considered relocating to Portland? Portland's really nice. If it was relocated to Portland. <laughs> Woo! -hoo. Uh, all right. Okay. Same six people. <laughs> 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 I only want to have beers with <laughs> So much to learn. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good.